Hey everybody, we're really glad that you're here. Lynn and I, we love doing this class and just glad that you're taking it. This is on marriage, of course, and uh, we just, we, we, we are very passionate about marriage ourselves. We had to work through some things ourselves and we feel as though we can be a benefit to you. We've been teaching this class for a lot of years and a lot of this material, in fact, same material that we've been using for many years. Well, and, and I'll tell, Scott, I'll tell them a little bit about yeah, us. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm just going to give you a little background on us. We have been married for... 35 years, we celebrated last summer, and we celebrated in ice. I look it, but she doesn't look it, so 35 years. Oh, good. Okay, yeah. you're, you're good so far. <laughs> Guys, that's a little bit, that's kind of what you do. That's, that's a little hint here, how do, you, how do you handle these things? Earning points. But we, we, so we celebrated in, in Iceland. Yes, we celebrated in Iceland. I hope that's not uh, a sign of things, being cold. Uh, we met in Bible college, but we came from very, very different backgrounds. Yeah, we did. Very different. Linda came from a very conservative Baptist home and uh, church background everything. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't grow up that way at all. I, I grew up in a, uh, well, I mean, a broken home, uh, and my high school was anything, was nothing like being Baptist. But I, I need to tell them about our first apartment. <laughs> okay, so, sure. Our very first apartment was an apartment, it, it was a cellar. It was not just a basement, but it was an actual cellar where you actually pick up the cellar doors and you go down into the cellar. It was just like Dorothy had in The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> That's right. And, and when it snowed, it was, it was really hard to get out of that <laughs> cellar. Um, but it was, it was just a half a little basement. And it was when efficiency. The an efficiency. And it was That's very right. efficient. It cost $150 a month. And that was with everything included. Yes. <laughs> and when the heater came on, you couldn't talk. No, because it was one of those that, you know, like they use them in a shop or a big yeah. uh, heater hung up from the ceiling. That's right. Blew really loud. And so you couldn't talk when the heater came on. But I, I, I remember our first Christmas in that apartment. You're going to tell and them about the Christmas tree? The Christmas the tree, because it kind of tells a little bit She's how different She's still a little bitter about this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it just shows a little bit of our differences, because um, I, we, we, when Scott was at work one night, I, we, we'd gotten a tree. And I got the tree. lights. It was a real tree. I got the lights out. I put these beautiful blue uh, lights all over the tree. It looked very romantic. Mm -hmm. um, I had it all set because in that apartment, we only had really one room. That was our living room and our bedroom. Efficiency apartment. It was all in one. In fact, when people came over, they sat on our bed. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I had the Christmas tree up, and it was so beautiful. I couldn't wait for Scott to get home from work. And when he got home, I was so proud to show him the Christmas tree was all decorated, and he was excited. And then when we got ready to go to bed, he went over and unplugged the tree. <laughs> well, I grew up where you have a nice light on. I mean, that was <laughs> supposed to be romantic. It was supposed to be nice. Linda, she used to like to and, leave a light on, and then the radio on real low, and it was like spooky yeah. sounding. And it just I like was it. very Dark romantic. And quiet. Mm -hmm. Yes. But, uh, that was the night that we figured out we were very, very different. Yes. <laughs> Honestly, we didn't know each other very well when we got married. Uh, we, it, it, we had to learn each other. We had to figure things out. And uh, because neither one of us, even though Linda came from a real conservative home, a much better home than I did, uh, neither one of us really had a marriage to look at from our parents to, to see this is how we should do things. So a lot of the material that we're giving to you is stuff that we learned ourselves. We had to figure out ourselves. We read a lot of books and went to conferences, marriage conferences, talked to a lot of people, got a lot of help. And so we're just trying to pass on to you the things that were helpful to us in those early years and things that we still learn well, even today. Some of the things we've had to learn through trial and error. We've you had bet. some arguments on things and we had to One kind of two. figure some things. It's been many years though. It's been many years since we've <laughs> had an argument. Uh, we'll, we'll tell you about some of them, and I think that you'll enjoy uh, that part of it as well. But, but first of all, I want to really emphasize, and I would say that the, the things that Linda and I that believed in very strongly that made the difference for us, and that was uh, first and foremost, we were absolutely committed to the fact that marriage was permanent, and secondly, that we were genuinely spiritually minded. We wanted God to be involved, and we, he want, we wanted Him to be pleased. And so because of the, those two elements, I think it helped us to work through a lot of the other things that were in our way. But it mattered to us. It was a big deal. We knew that our marriage had to work. And I think that I, I'm convinced that for a lot of people, and Linda, you know, you and I, we both talk to a lot of people that are struggling, that for a lot of people, it's not that big of a deal. They're willing to let it go. They're willing for their marriage to either die or to fail or just to live with a bad marriage. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think I there's think, a... I don't think they realize the, the ramifications of all of that, how it spills no. over into so much of your life. Yes, their kids' lives as well as their personal mm -hmm. lives. And uh, th there's been a lot of research that has been done on this, and we know, we, we simply know that people that have bad marriages, their lives are worse off in, in so many um, facets. 
just not the least of which is economical, financial. Time Magazine recently wrote this. Marriage gives all parties involved an economic boost. People who are married do better financially. In fact, stable marriages could be perpetuating the growing division in American society between the haves and the have-nots. Marriage, quite simply, is a form of having. Children growing up with both of their biological parents are likely to be more educated, to have better job skills, and a more secure sense of themselves. Thus, they enter adulthood with a greater chance of success and a greater likelihood of finding a mate than a similar profile. So it, this is a big deal. Mar whether or not you have a strong marriage and you hold things together, you keep it together, even if it's just for the sake of your kids, and, and I, I would say if that's the only reason, then it's still a, a good reason to stay together, but there's far more reasons than that, that, that this is going to wind up benefiting you. We also know the opposite of this is also true. Bad marriages are bad for people and bad for society. Um, we know that a bad marriage depresses the body's immune system. Unhappily married women have subnormal levels of white blood cells, which, you know, blood, white blood cells destroy infections. And so they therefore also have increased virus activity. This is, this is medicine. Divorced men um, under the age of 65 have considerably higher mortality rates than their married counterparts. So you get divorced, you have, a more, you have a more likely chance of dying young than if you stay married. You say, oh man, if I stay married to that woman, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to die. Well, <laughs> I, I don't think that's really true, but um, you're better off health-wise. The death rate is twice as high for lung cancer and strokes, three times as high for diseases related to hypertension, and seven times higher for cirrhosis of the liver for men who are divorced. Maybe that's because they, they, you know, they wind up drinking more. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. But uh, so many studies have been done that point to a downward spiral in health issues after divorce. So just for health reasons and economic reasons, it makes sense for you to make this marriage work. And guys, uh, let me tell you, who guys often work, uh, seem to have a less of a, a real desire to hold things together when things fall apart or just let it go. Um, things are worse for you. The guys who get divorced are worse off than women who get divorced, even though it's bad for both, both parties. So it's a bigger deal. Health problems after divorce for men increase a lot more than women. Uh, emotional and mental health also deteriorate after a divorce. Uh, I think they're tied together. I think the physical and the emotional mental are all tied together. So the economic, the cost of a divorce, uh, and then the separate households, the competing money spent on children, all of these kinds of things wind up making it worse for people financially. But it impacts friends, too. It absolutely and does. I, I, I do have to, to interject this. I know when you had your surgery uh, for gallbladder, I remember kind of laughing with the doctor, and we asked him, do you have a fight with your wife? <laughs> you know, if you're going <laughs> yeah. into surgery, you want to make sure that, okay, you know. Yeah, I want to uh, make sure things were everything. good with him before he did <laughs> surgery on me. That's right. But it does, uh, you know, when people get divorced, they don't realize how this is going to impact their friendships, but it does, because most people who go through a divorce, they wind up losing a vast majority of their friends. Uh, a close, and, and then it also impacts whether or not their close friends have healthy marriages, because after a divorce, uh, their close friend divorce rates increase by 146%. So because when you are close to somebody who gets a divorce, it winds up planting that into your mind, and you wind up affecting other people as well. Um, and, and the breakup after cohabitating has the same emotional and economic reprisals as divorce. And so you think, well, we're just living together. We're not married. Or that's why we're not going to get married. You, listen, you have the same, when, when there's a breakup with two people that are living together, it has the same kind of negative impact on cohabitating couples as it does on married couples. And the sad thing is, and we're hard, hardly even getting into this at all, the greatest harm is to the children. And the studies that have been done, and we always say, well, the kids bounce back great, they're handling things very well, they're hiding things very well, but those of you that come from broken families, I'm one of them, you know that the impact of the marriage failure on your parents' part is something that you never get away from. So the negative impact on children is also huge. And uh, second generation divorces are a lot more common. So you get divorced, your kids are more likely to get divorced as well. And that kind of brings us to our title, Improving Your Marriage by Yourself Together. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's really the only way you can improve your marriage. Yeah, I think it's a great title. Mm -hmm. And um, I think by leaning into the principles in that, that um, and you become the, the husband or wife that God wants you to, was it 90% of the time? 
that um, you know. Yeah, the, you, the you other can partner will will reciprocate. Mm -hmm. But but the point that we're trying to make in this title is that the only way for you to improve your marriage is for you to stop looking at your spouse and stop thinking about what he should be doing or she should be doing. And the only way for you to improve your marriage is to stop expecting them to reciprocate and you just decide that you're going to be the husband God wants you to be no matter what. You're just going to be the wife God wants you to be no matter what he does. You just focus on yourself. You improve your marriage by yourself. It's the only way that you can. And as yeah, Linda was it, saying, 90% of the time, the spouse will reciprocate. But it's not always guaranteed. It's not guaranteed. Okay. And if you do it with that in mind, you're not really going to pour you're yourself not doing into it. For the it. Right reason. And it's, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we want to do this together, but we want you to be focused on yourself. Stop thinking yeah. about your husband or your wife in, in this class. Be you focus on improving your because marriage. Because even by if yourself. they don't d change, you are better off. Yes, you absolutely. You are better off through it. You've got a clear and, conscience. You know mm -hmm. you're doing things right before God, and That's you're going right. to be happier because you can be in a tough marriage. If you're handling yourself in a way that's pleasing before God, you can still be happy even though the marriage is not doing but well. But the, the ideal thing would be to do it together. Yes. You know, but you can, you know, you can start these principles on your own. And, and whenever a marriage improves, it's always one person that is way ahead of the other and working at following through these principles. Mm -hmm. well, let's get going here because we want to get into the scriptures. And there's actually uh, the passage we're using as a foundation. We're going to follow this through the whole class is Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. And so these are the foundations. This is where your notes actually start in your booklets. So if you want to grab those booklets, and we want to look at here Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on all of it, but uh, we'll get to verse 24 and 25 of the heart of it. So... Um, we read here, then the Lord God said, this is the creation of Adam and Eve and bringing, uh, first of all, creating Adam and then bringing uh, Eve to Adam. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. And so uh, I think that speaks socially, just we were created as social beings, but also, and, and while we know that there are many people that are single and we love them and we, we don't want to ever give, send the notion that they're incomplete without being with a man or being with a woman, but the fact of the matter is that we were created to desire and to crave the kind of relationship that you have as a husband and wife. And so here we read this. It, God said it's not good that the man... The only thing that God said was not good after creation was Adam being alone without Eve. Mm -hmm. So he says, I will make him a helper fit for him. Linda's going to talk about that wording there later on in this, but... Uh, now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. What I, what I like this, that helper fit, it's really, uh, it, it means corresponding, one that's corresponding to him. So he noticed that. And, and it's like God brought these Adams, male and female, before him so that Adam could actually begin to see what he was lacking and to begin to crave to have what some of these animals had. But there, while he saw well, there, every animal, there was a Mr. and a Mrs. or there was a male and a female, but for him, it was just, it was just him. There wasn't the corresponding female for him. And so it created a, a desire, and then God met that desire. It says, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up, up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And I love the, the picture, the term, you know, just the picturesque of this, that it is from the rib by his side, from the place his arm over, but to be alongside him, not for him to hover over her or to be underneath her, but for her to be under his protection and at the same time beside him. And then you have these words from Adam, which, Linda, we've talked about this before. I mean, this is kind of cool. When, when you read the, this at last, is bone of my bones, in the Hebrew, it's really hard to translate that. Um, it's not literally this at last. It's actually a... a it was an exclamation, a Hebrew exclamation of which there is no English translation. I think a better translation would have been wow. Because you, and that's the, the Hebrew was just a, a simple exclamation without a real genuine meaning, like wow has no real meaning other than wow. And that's what the Hebrew word behind this is. When you think about it from Adam's perspective, he's seen the male and the female of all the animals. He's, he's feeling this loneliness. He's longing to have a... A, a mate, like the animals all have a mate, and then God brings this beautiful woman, and she's fully unclothed, beautiful, standing before him, and he's just like, wow. You know, I, I, a little Lindaology here. I think he looked at her and said, whoa, man. <laughs> that's, and that's where woman came There was she called woman. <laughs> 
This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called, as Linda said, whoa, whoa man, man, because she was taken out of man. And then we have this foundational verse, and this is where we get the whole outline for this whole class out of. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, that's, we're going we're to talk about that yet today, and hold fast to his wife, we're going to talk about that also today, and they shall become one flesh, we'll talk about that next week, and the man and his wife are both naked, and we're not ashamed. We'll talk about that the, the, the final week. And it's not what you're thinking about. It's not like we're going to talk about sex. Well, we're not, we're not going to avoid sex. We'll talk about it. But, but the, something even bigger than that. And I think we're going to find that this, this, the foundations of this passage is going to be so good. Mm -hmm. um, but the whole thing, it starts right here. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother. So and Linda, I'm talking about a severance. severance. Severance, right there. Mm -hmm. And we have seen this. Mm -hmm. This is a problem, man, in so many marriages. I, I don't think a month goes by without me having a conversation with a husband or wife where they're struggling with this, this very thing in their marriage. And so what are we talking about severance? What is severance, Linda? Well, kind of going from a nuclear family to extended family. Yes. So we had that conversation with Junior when he got married, and we did with Erica. We've, mm -hmm. we've done this with both of our kids. We've got a son who's getting married this summer, and we'll have that conversation with mm -hmm. him as well. And, and I remember Junior not liking it. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, it's becoming, I think it's, it, it's deciding I'm no longer dependent on my parents Yes. for a lot of things. So these are actually the blanks you want to fill in. As Linda had said earlier, from, you're going from nuclear family to extended family. So, mm -hmm. so when you get married, your mom and dad are no longer your nuclear family. Your mom and dad are now your extended family. And that's the conversation we had with Junior, with Erica, we'll have with Brock as well, that we want them to understand that's hard for a parent. In, in fact, most of you, your parents probably weren't that eager to let go. Not that we were eager to let go, but we've, because, because of our position and teaching this class and doing enough marriage counseling, we realized it's such a problem that we knew that our kids were not going to have healthy marriages, and they weren't going to be happy without healthy marriages. And so we were thinking they weren't going to have healthy marriages if they didn't understand the necessity of letting go of us as being their immediate family. And so you, your extended family, your parents are your extended family. Your siblings are your extended family. Your nuclear family is your, your wife or your husband. And your children. Mm -hmm. Now, Linda, this is also, we've seen this to be more of a problem with guys mm -hmm. than it is with women, mm -hmm. usually. Mm -hmm. It's usually the women, it, it, we make mother in law jokes right. about the husband's mother in law, but there's very rarely a problem with the, with the wife's mom. It's usually the problem with the husband's mom. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that man and that, that mom unwilling to break that bond. Mm -hmm. But you've got to do it, man. It's time for you to be a man and say, she is my wife. You're my extended family mom. Mm -hmm. And that comes when there's disagreements and there's different things like that. Holidays is Holidays, usually a big one. It's, you have to come together and realize that you yeah. are a family. And, and husbands, listen, it's your job. It's your job to make that break. Mm -hmm. And your job to communicate that mm -hmm. and to protect your wife in the middle of all of that. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, secondly, it also, you started with yeah. this, no longer dependent on okay. parents. And you know, with that... There's a lot of ways we can be dependent on our parents, and I know one way I struggled with was acceptance and always wanting my um, my mom to uh, accept what I did. Yeah. And I was always looking for her approval. So it was an emotional so dependence. Then. It was an emotional dependence, and so I would often, if my mom liked a certain thing versus my husband, I would tend to sway. Well, I, you know, I still want my mom's approval here, mm -hmm. and that was a problem. You know, sure. I realized that you know that's. This, we are a family. We yeah. are a couple, and it should depend. It should it should matter yeah. what we as spouses um, uh, think. But so, also, family loyalty. Mm -hmm. Family loyalty is transferred to the spouse. So this kind of ties in with that first point that we're making. But your loyalty now has to move from your parents to your spouse and to your children, to your nuclear family. Your loyal, your first loyalty has got to be to your husband or your wife. And, and again, I always say, it's the, it's the biological child. If there's a problem with parents, with in-laws, it's the biological child, that, the actual child, not the in-law, that needs to have that conversation. And if you don't have the courage to do that, then man up or woman up and get the courage and you be the one to have that conversation or those conversations because they may have to happen over time. But you're going to continue to drive a wedge between your wife or your, usually it's the wife, 
and mother, but you're going to continue to drive a wedge between your spouse and, and, and your parents if you don't have the courage to actually be the one to have that and have those conversations and make sure that your spouse understands your first loyalty is to them. Basically, stand up for each other. Yes, absolutely. Stand up for each other. Uh, and then fourthly, no expectations of a parent, uh, of a parent from your spouse. This can almost be confusing. What we mean by this is that a lot of guys go into marriage having been very well mothered by their moms, expecting their wife to be what? Their mom. Yeah. Now, I didn't do that. No. Because I didn't have much of a mom. Right. <laughs> I, didn't get, I didn't get much mothering. Um, so I had a lot of other problems. <laughs> well, we'll get to them. Yeah. I guess I did expect, I did expect you to kind of pick up after me because yeah. I... I wasn't expecting you to pick up to me. I was just expecting to live in a mess. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and you weren't but, willing to do that, yeah. and so yeah. over time I have learned. You've learned very well. You're very, very well trained now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't expect, you can, uh, in, in the same way that you can't expect your husband to be like your dad was or to treat you like your dad because he's your husband, he's not your dad. And you can't expect your, your wife to cook the way your mom did, and you should never compare the two. Or to, to be the way your mom was. Or, Scott, even calling each other mom and dad. That yeah. really, uh, it, it, it's not romantic. We never did that. Yeah. No, no. Um, it really does affect the physical life. You know? I, I, we talked about this briefly in the staff, and Brian and Michelle Nelson, if you know Brian, Brian are our executive pastor, and uh, Brian and Michelle, and, and both of them looked at each other when we were talking about people calling each other mom and dad, and they went, ooh. It was like, how can you make love with each other after calling each other mom or dad? I know, you know, it's, it's one thing we would say to the kids that are growing up, I would say, go ask mom or talk to mom about this, but I would never, when, when Linda's in the room and I'm talking to her, I never said, what do you think, mom? It would never be that mm -hmm. because she's my wife. Um, she, you know, she's my babe. She's, she's the one that I want to see in a very romantic way and calling her mom destroys that. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, you need, you need to have that uh, severance. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's severance. Uh, but in that passage, uh, we read, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, which is severance. And mm -hmm. it's speaking primarily, it, you know, this is so a man shall leave his father and mother. And I, I really think it's directed to men because men struggle more with this than, and really giving it their all and understanding, hey, I am responsible for this marriage. I am responsible for our home life. And so a man shall leave his father and mother and then shall hold fast to his wife. What is that mm -hmm. second point? That is permanence, that marriage is for life. Absolutely for life. For life. And uh, I think it's so often in the arguments, it's so easy to throw around the, the D word or, you know, I'm just going to leave then. And it's just the easy way out. They're we get hot-headed too. We want to like really grab their attention. Oh, I've just had it. And, and, so, and so we think right. that, and I, I think it's a form of manipulation. It's a way that we manipulate the conversation. Like we're going to shut it down by by, by threatening, threatening divorce mm -hmm. or separation. Mm -hmm. That's one thing we tried to do. Uh, actually, before we, we were married, we actually made a commitment that we would not ever use the D word, which we call it the D word because we didn't even want to say it. Yes, yeah. Um, and I, 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 we didn't get marriage counseling, so I, you know, I, and it's probably a good thing because the pastor who married us, uh, he wound up having an affair and having to leave the ministry, so I'm glad we didn't get it from him. But I, I don't even know where we got it from. It was a preacher or something, but we, this was, had been recommended to us. We made the commitment before we were married, when we were engaged, mm -hmm. to never, not even use the word, but also to never imply it or even, even separation. It was, never, it was never part of our vocabulary. And not that we got along great all the time. Because no, because there were times I thought... Divorce never, murder maybe. Yeah, I, th I think she was considering murder a few times. <laughs> uh, in, in fact, uh, I, she, I mean, she's made it clear. Listen, you ever cheat on me, you will be a dead yes, man, and I know how to do it and get away with it. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I have a good fear of her. Some of some, I, some of you wives, you let your husbands walk all over you. I, I, I have great respect. Yeah. And for I've my wife enough, and healthy fear. I've watched enough of those snapped movies. Yeah. <laughs> she, so knows, she knows how to get away with it. Yeah, so I'm, right, I'm very careful. Good. But anyway, divorce never. And no, in fact, it, we would never even, it was never a joke. It was never, it's funny, we joke about murder, but we would never <laughs> joke about divorce. Because once you go there, it's so easy to, to mm -hmm. get back there again. And you don't realize how damaging it is to everybody. Yeah. You think it's just a quick fix doesn't work out you get a divorce you go on 
but it damages everyone. And I want to say this, because I know that a lot of you who are taking this class, you've been through a divorce. And, I, I, and again, I, the thing that I have learned is those who have gone through the heartache of divorce are the most outspoken in, in talking about how it is not the answer and it is something that you really do, 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 want, do not want to go there. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but I want to say this as well. That we're talking about from here on out. We're not talking about the past. The stuff that we're talking about here is not to make anybody feel guilty about what you've been through, what you've gone through, poor decisions that you've made, or what people have done to you, the fact that somebody divorced you, or, or even if it was your decision. We're not talking about the past year, though I think we do have to face the past. We have to make proper confessions and, and get back on and, and do what, we need, what God wants us to do, but we're not talking about the past year. We're talking about the future. And so you've got to make the decision from here on out, even if you've used that word or if you've been through a divorce. So You've got to make your decision right now that never again in this marriage, I will never again threaten divorce or even imply it or joke about it. So, Scott, what would you say the alternative would be to, you know, the quote that people say, stay married and be miserable or divorce and be happy? That's a great question. I just thought I better get this up here because I didn't put oh. those blanks up here. This must be settled. Don't even use the D word. But, um, and, and that is... Um, yeah, I guess we also have this. Divorce damages everyone. <laughs> New relationships. Yeah, let's say this first. We'll get to that. But, but let's say this, because uh, I, I think this is really important to say. So many people think that their difficulties in this marriage is going to get fixed by divorcing this person. They can find somebody else. New relationships do not ever fix the damages done by poor relationships or divorce. All they do is they just pile on the baggage. Because you're, you're going to bring in whatever baggage you have in this relationship, you're going to bring that baggage into the next. Mm -hmm. And so uh, divorce not, damages it, everyone. Mm -hmm. It's statistics for that. Uh, are they're, not they're overwhelming. They're mm -hmm. overwhelming. All right, this is what you were getting to earlier. Mm -hmm. There is an alternative to stay married and be miserable or divorce and be happy. Because this is what I've heard time and again where people said, well, you know, it's, it's, either, it's either stay married and be miserable or I can get divorced and be happy. Well, first of all, Getting divorced does not equate to being happy, which I'll show you in a little bit. But there is an alternative to staying married and, and be miserable, and that is stay married and be happy. Now, first of all, if you be the right, the, the kind of husband or wife that God is calling you to be, even if your husband or wife doesn't change things, you can still be happy. You can be happy in a difficult marriage. But secondly, if you be everything that God is calling you to be as a husband or wife and stop pointing fingers at him or her and everything that, that, that he or she is doing wrong and you get really focused on being the person that God wants you to be, the majority of the time, 90% of the time, the chances are he is going to wind up changing. And not only can you find that you yourself are happy because you're the person that God asks you to be, but also the marriage winds up turning around because that is going to be the motivator for your spouse to begin to change as well. But uh, getting back to the divorce damages, everyone, and what you're bringing up, that it does not make anybody happy. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are some fascinating studies that have been done about this. In fact, one that was done not that long ago by Linda Waite at the, just right here in, in our area, University of Chicago. Um, she came out with a report that says that the question was, or the title was, does divorce make people happy? And the answer is simply no. This is a... This is a huge study that was done on those that had been divorced, and actually it was a, long, a longitudinal study in that it started with people that were unhappily married. And it followed people that were unhappily married that described themselves this way. It followed uh, those that got divorced, and it followed those that stayed married even though they were unhappily married. And uh, followed 5,200 people, and they, they rated their marriage from a 1 to 7. Those, those rating marriage as 2 or lower were given the same questionnaire five years later. So they rated their marriage as being a two or lower, in other words, very unhappy, in a one to seven. They were given the same questionnaire five years later. Some were divorced, and the ones that were divorced had the same level of happiness in life after their divorce. They thought their unhappiness was because of their unhappy marriage. But after they were divorced, they rated their personal happiness at the same level that they rated it before the divorce. Um, so now some stayed married, and here's the thing, eight out of ten of those who stayed married, five years later, then rated their marriage and their happiness at a five or higher. The sheer willpower of staying married 
wound up creating more happiness in them than in those that wound up taking the easy way out and getting divorced. Two-thirds reported higher levels of personal happiness by staying married. And so uh, divorce does not make anybody happy. I mean, that, that thinking that, well, I'm going to stay married uh, and be miserable or divorce and be happy. No, it's actually the opposite of this. And the three reasons that uh, Linda Waite cited, she said, number one, sheer endurance, just the sheer endurance of sticking with it created some personal satisfaction. And, but it also led them to work on their marriage because they forced themselves to stay in it. They started making some changes and they began to work on the relationship. And the third reason was the alternative, is that they found alternative happiness. They stopped depending on the relationship for their happiness, which, which by the way, is always going to be a problem. If, if you need your relationship or your marriage to be good in order for you to be happy, you're going to be a needy partner and you're probably not going to be happy even if the marriage is a good marriage. It's draining. It, depending on your spouse for your happiness yeah. is, is never going to work. And it then drains the marriage mm -hmm. as well because you're, you're so dependent on the marriage for your personal happiness when that's never going to produce happiness anyway, it winds up making the marriage more difficult. Um, so those that found alternative sources of happiness, um, they, um, they wound up doing better. I'm actually thinking about a marriage right now, Linda, and, and if, you know, I could tell you could probably... <clears throat> You know who I'm talking about very quickly, but I'm thinking of a marriage right now where it seemed to have everything wrong with it. In fact, as a pastor, I'd have a hard time telling that person not to get divorced, especially when, I can, when you consider what was going on. I, I, I would actually tell the person, you've got to get out just for your own safety, because in this marriage, there was, there was physical abuse. There was some substance abuse going on, because the, along with the substance abuse, I would never blame alcohol or drugs on physical abuse, but this guy was actually abusive. To his wife and it was horrible uh, there was also infidelity he had cheated on his wife a number of times and she was also unfaithful either one of them were believers they had a child they, they wound up divorcing they, they not just separated but they wound up divorcing they had a child who wound up coming to church for a children's ministry program of some sort and the child wound up talking her dad on the weekends when he had her talking her dad into coming to church as well and he came just out of because of the persistence of the child and he started hearing the message of the gospel for the first time and after several weeks of this it sunk in and he was just radically transformed got into a bible study with a group of guys faced his sin head on and came to full confession and then he started inviting his ex-wife to church as well of course she wasn't going to hear anything of it it took a long time, and I think it's largely because of the persistence of the child as well that brought this woman out to church. And at first, they didn't even sit together. She started hearing the message of the gospel. She started, her heart started, started leaning towards the message. Her heart and life was transformed. The two of them started going to church together. They met with a pastor who suggested they start doing some counseling and some dating. Eventually, they got married. And that was, that they were married again about the time that we got married. Mm -hmm. They've been married as long as we've been married, married for the second time to the same people. They went into ministry. He wound up feeling called to go into ministry full time. And the two of them together have been impacting marriages in such a positive way ever since. I'm telling you, nobody is without hope. And whatever it is that you have gone through in your relationship and what you've been struggling with, and you're thinking we're talking about this permanent stuff, like, like, you're, like we're taking away the hope that you have of being able to just end this and move on to something new, I'm telling you that God can do some just unbelievable miracles if you will just make up your mind, not just to go to him and ask for help, but you make up your mind that you're going to be, be obedient and you're going to do as he has called you to do. Well, there's a third point that we have here in this passage we're going to get into. We're going to get started with this yet this week, and we're going to make more headway on it next week. The meat of this is going to be next week. What I want to get started with is, and that is, um, he, also, he says that, that the man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. One flesh. This speaks of unity. Because that's the whole reason for getting married in the first place, is so that the two of you can enjoy the unity together. But I have a feeling that some of you are not sensing that unity right now. 
And, and so I, we want to talk about that yeah, for a little come bit. Come from different things, gender, yeah. Bar uh, personality, barriers. These barriers. These are barriers that, that we have to this. You've got gender, personality, background differences. Yeah. A lot of those add to... Um, gender, just male and female. Mm -hmm, I mean, we think differently. Mm -hmm. you, you, I, and I don't know if... I, I know that this is not politically correct, but the fact of the matter is men and women are very different. Every single cell in your body, every male cell is different from every female cell. So every cell in your body, if you're a man says that you're a man and is different from your wife. And so there are differences. We think differently. We really do. We process information. This is all scientific. It's not politically correct, so you don't see much of it anymore. But it's very real. Every man here, when you're in the womb of your mother, there was a testosterone bathe over your brain, and it literally separated the right and the left hemispheres, creating, I guess, a little bit of brain damage. <laughs> But it makes us think differently. And so mm -hmm. that's why men and women, we do, we process information differently. Well, even our personalities, because I think, Scott, with you and I, I don't think there's any two people that are more different than no. each other. In fact, I think <laughs> if we would have gone on a match.com, they probably would have flagged us as do not ever let them together. Don't put meet them together. Yes, we would I, never have would been never put together. No. We're very, very different. Yeah, we think differently, or we used to. I, I mean, man, that was 35 years ago, uh, and it's amazing how similar we think today and the similar mm -hmm. interests that we have mm -hmm. today, but that's after being together for 35 mm -hmm. years. So yes, mm -hmm. personality. We have mm -hmm. major differences in uh, personality. And, um, and so, um, yeah, family background. Mm -hmm. These are mm -hmm. all barriers. There's a lot of things that are against you experiencing unity. Mm -hmm. So you have to be open to recognizing what are these barriers and then well, what Scott, can we do about them. with family background, I do have to share that when we first got together with your family, with your sisters yeah. and their families for Christmas, and I hosted it, we hosted it at our house, and I came from a family where things were very organized and orderly, everything yeah. was orderly, and when it came to Christmas, you opened up one gift at a time. And everybody watches. And everybody watched. You and do then it slowly you so you can fold it. the wrapping mm -hmm. paper up before you throw yeah, it away. Which is the right way to do it. Um, but then w when we hosted your sisters and their family, of course, we had a lot of kids, a lot of kids I didn't kids tell at her ahead of time. I, I didn't tell you ahead of time what no. was going to happen. <laughs> so when it came time to open the gifts and there was all these little children around, I thought, okay, we'll all take turns. I had no idea it was just a rap fest. <laughs> it was like all of a sudden, and paper was like, all over was done. the place. And I, didn't, I had no idea what, who got what and what was what, and paper was all <laughs> over. And um, I tried to organize things after that, but I, I think it was too deep in your family history. <laughs> that. Yeah, we was... come from very different family backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And those things, they, because you're just used to doing things differently, you're used to eating differently, you're used to going to bed at different times or spend your evenings differently and use your free time differently, all of those things, they create barriers for unity. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're talking about unity, we're not talking about a feeling. Mm -mm. Of, of, I feel united with this person. Um, and, uh, and I want to, I've got to bring this in at this point because I hear it, I usually hear this idea of soulmate when there's a divorce going on. I've, I've heard guys say this, oh, I, I need to find my soulmate. And I know always when I hear a guy saying that when he's married to somebody else, that he's already having, if not a mental affair, an actual affair going on for him to even make that statement. Because the fact of the matter is there's no such thing as a soulmate. And when I say soulmate, that is that is this one person that was created just for me, and we just naturally, all of a sudden, we just mesh together. Now, if there is such thing as a soulmate, I feel like Linda and I are soulmates, but we were not just naturally unified. Mm -hmm. this, this took some work. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, yeah. and having this idea, this idea that there's a soulmate out there, I think that in and of itself becomes a barrier for unity because then people don't do the work that's necessary to enjoy the kind of unity that God wants you to have. But he wants you in wor working together with the Holy Spirit to go after this. Mm -hmm. When they say, too, like 50-50, you know, marriage is 50-50. And I, I know we don't never believe that. Unity. It's never unity. It's giving 100%. Yeah. And uh, 50, 50, when you think about 50-50, it's like two halves trying to be pushed together. Well, well there's still two separates. So it's, it's not, marriage is not 50-50. It's, it's, it's 100-100. And it has to be 100 from your end meshing together, 100 from your end, without, without requiring the other person to do the 100. Because otherwise, you're just going to get disappointed, you're going to go back. That's really a 50-50 if you're requiring them to reciprocate in the same way. Mm -hmm. and so it's yeah. got to be, you just decide, I am 100% into this. 
a few, uh, several years ago, in our, early on in our marriage, we went to a marriage seminar that we were at, and I remember the speaker saying, um, a lot of times marriages settle into one person becomes the host and one person becomes the guest. Mm -hmm. And that's just how life's, and it's usually the one that, you know, uh, is the pleaser, ends up being, the you know, host. the host yeah. all the time. And um, he said, try entering marriage where you both are the host, always looking out for the other person. And that's what Paul said when he said, outdo one another in love right. and good works. And we I, play I, that out in our marriages. Right. Yeah. And I think it, it does, it's not the big things always. I don't need flowers every week. But when you... You would like them once in a while, though. Once in a you? while would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when she you... She told me before we got married she didn't care for flowers, and I believed her. Well, so. <laughs> sometimes. I mean... <laughs> um, but it's the, the bringing me my tea when I'm, you know, you picked me up from work one day and you had my favorite tea. I said, hey, I got some hot tea for you. That was huge. Those little things and then always looking to really just outdo each other in, in kindness to each other. Yeah. Stop thinking 50-50. Think mm -hmm. in terms of host. I'm going to be the host in this. Whether or not my husband or wife returns it, if they're just going to be the guest, I'm still going to be the host. Yeah. Because even if you enter it that you want to do it because you really want to show love, not because you're looking to get something back, but if you really want to show love, it's actually going to make you feel better. Yeah. And if you think about it this way, if you're looking to get something back by your show of love, that's not really love, which we'll get to the definition of what real love is. Because then it's, it's just an investment, like you're looking for a return on your investment. But love is a giving of oneself without expecting anything in return. So it's not a 50-50 no. enterprise. But you know, I think it goes back to the unifying thing, which is the Holy Spirit. That's it. The That's greatest right. unifier. Mm -hmm. And how can, we, how can we actually take advantage of the Holy Spirit, how he wants to draw us together, bring us together? Mm -hmm. Well, it, things like um, it should be, you know, become habits in our uh, lives, like praying together, reading the Bible together, you know, talking about Scripture reading. And um, You and I really don't ever sit down and read the Bible at the same time mm -hmm. together, but we talk about what we've been reading or have read, and we'll ask questions and we'll discuss those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that, I think that is going to accomplish a whole lot than like you read a verse, he reads a verse. I, I don't know many couples that are going to ever do that long term. Mm -hmm. But I think do praying together. I mean, I, I don't know if there's ever been times when we have felt closer than when we pray together. And I tell you why we often don't pray together, because sometimes when we know that we're not actually living our faith, we feel a little embarrassed praying in front of our, our husband or wife. Um, but Linda and I did some mentoring uh, with a couple uh, about a year ago, and uh, they had never once ever prayed together one time. Mm -hmm. And, and it just, it's, an, it's just been an amazing thing to see the radical changes taking place in their marriage over and this last year. You could tell, like, when they would, they would come back and we'd meet together, and it was like they were so excited to share yeah. that you, we prayed together. The and first time they prayed together, they were, tell, like, excited to tell us about they it. They were excited to tell us, and you could just tell the difference in the way that they actually interacted with each other. This there, husband stopped me uh, uh, about a month or so ago, and we were at some event, a church event. He stopped me and goes, hey, Scott, no, we haven't gotten together for a while, but I, I want you to tell you this. <laughs> what has happened just because of us getting together. He said, the one thing that's come out of this that has changed everything, and that is a day does not go by that my wife and I do not pray together. And it's like, wow. Mm -hmm. major celebration that, pray yeah, together yeah. that's mm -hmm. the holy spirit bringing the two of you together talk mm -hmm. about scripture reading and attend church together mm -hmm. I, and if i can interject a little bit here with attending church together um that is attending together as a couple you know take advantage of bridge kids put yes, your children put in your the kids. nursery moms and dads listen i know this is usually moms listen you need to worship with your husband without distraction standing next to him, holding his hand, or just lifting your hands together, being together in church. You mm -hmm. need that mm -hmm. time, the two of you together in church. Put your yeah. kids in bridge kids yeah. for and no other reason than just for you and your husband to be together in church. And there's other reasons for that, but that's in the parenting mm -hmm. class. And Put I, your I, kids in bridge kids and worship together. I understand because I, I was a mom that it's yeah. hard to let go of my kids and I wanted to make sure that they were safe and all of that, and so coming from a mom that was like that, it's so important that you utilize that, take advantage of that, worship together, because your marriage is important for your kids. For Before we get into our time for discussion, because we want to give you time for this, I just got a couple of other things. I, you want to just briefly go through some of these other things that produce unity, and that is, uh, first of all, um, some of these additional things, shared commitment. 
that is the two of you, Lynn and I have always said, this was like number one for us, that and our desire to please God in our marriage. Um, shared commitment, that, that we have an absolute commitment that both of us share in this commitment that we're going to make this marriage work. That's huge. That will create unity, just having that shared commitment. Secondly, mm -hmm. shared goals. And I think that would be a great date night for you guys, uh, to, for the two of you to do this next week. Have a date night. Set it aside. We'll talk about having a date night mm -hmm. in a couple of weeks. But set aside a day sometime this week or next week mm -hmm. where you can put together what are your goals as a couple? What are your goals mm -hmm. as a family? What, what do you want to accomplish together? So and, shared goals. And shared values. Believing in the same mm -hmm. kinds of things and actually being together in church and maybe reading some of the same books and mm -hmm. having conversations. Of course, there's going to be some things that you differ on. That's okay. That, you know, I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's a beneficial thing. You, you can sharpen each other by having some differences. But have mm -hmm. your val you want to share your values. Mm -hmm. um, shared time. This is huge. Linda and I, really, we work hard at doing this because we didn't have mutual interests. We were very so, opposite. Mm -hmm. Yes. We had to create some things. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've mm -hmm. done this a lot down through the years. We've come up with stuff that we could do together. That's actually why I have a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. Because Linda loves riding with me. And, and, you know, honestly, I didn't think I would. But I actually embraced it because I knew it was something that, um, you know, I mean, you, you, you were looking at it. You knew I wanted to do it. enjoyed so, yes. it. Yep. And I thought, you know what? Maybe this will be kind of fun. And so I embraced it. Now, now I love it. In yeah. fact, um, I even ask for rides when you're... You know, you come home from work, it's like, let's go, let's go take a ride a little bit. So it's, it's embracing what your, some of the interests that your spouse has. There are a number of hobbies, and we're involved in another new, kind of a new endeavor right now that we're pouring ourselves into, but we've come up with these things creatively that otherwise neither one of us may have an interest in, mm -hmm. that we take an interest in so that we could do things together. Because so I think that shared time, having shared interests, doing things together is huge. And then uh, share projects, you know, coming up with a project that you can get involved in, whether it's in the community, in the church, or at home, um, accomplishments together, victories together, but also failures, even failing at something together. That can produce some real unity if you handle these things in a biblical way. Well, listen, we're going to get into, I think, a, a, a great a, a, a kind of a mechanism that the Bible gives us for pursuing unity. We're going to start talking about next week. You don't want to miss next week. It's going to be really good. And so uh, I think a lot of fun stuff we're going to talk about and some challenging things we're going to talk about next week. So you want to be here for this next week. But let's take some time and break up into the groups. And uh, I think that you'll enjoy this as well. And be open. Be open with each other. And so what we want, what we want you to do right now is we've got some great questions on this, this page right here that go through and, and talk about these things together as a group. And, and don't... Don't allow for yourself to be that couple that zaps the time away from everybody else. Let's everybody participate in this. But also, don't be that guy or that woman that just sits there and says nothing. Participate in this together because you're going to find by opening up, even if you've got some tough spots, maybe some embarrassing things here, go ahead and open up because it's amazing how that opening, what that can do to kind of start creating these steps, making these steps, moving forward. And making a better marriage for yourself. I know some of you are here, you got great marriages, and you just want to, hey, continue on and make things a little bit better, which is great. Some of you here are struggling. And so let's do all that we can to allow for us to have the kind of marriage that God envisioned when he came up with the, with the idea in the first place. All right. Glad you took the class once again. Have a great time of discussion. And let me just close in prayer. Father, I thank you for this material that we've been able to look at. Biblical principles. Help us to apply these things to our lives now. And as we come back next week to learn some more stuff, help us to make some steps of improvement, even this week, even if it's just a little step like that idea of permanence, that never again will there ever be a threat or even a joke about ending this because we know that this reflects the relationship that you desire with us. And so may we honor you in our relationships with one another. In Jesus' name, amen.